Thing here at the Overlook of um, Spruce Tree House, and uh, my talk today is going to be on the early archaeology that that uh, that occurred here. Um, before we start talking about archaeology, though, we need to talk a little bit about uh, how this land became uh, the home for so many uh, of the uh, of the cliff dwellers. Um, First of all, uh, you know, we call this Mesa Verde, but it's, 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 it's really not a mesa. A mesa is the Spanish word for table, and mesas are generally flat on the top. As you guys drove in here today from, uh, from uh, the, the park entrance, you probably noticed that um, from Farview Point, we were coming downhill all the way here. And so this is actually what the Spanish would call a cuesta. It's kind of like a, a table that if you sawed like a few inches off the bottom of two of the legs, it would drop down. And it drops down to the south, which is, uh, which is really uh, a good for agriculture here. So the first people to come in up here were hunters and gatherers, and they came in and they looked for food, but they were transient. They, you know, they, they moved and, and they followed uh, the seasons, uh, hunting uh, when they could and, and, and gathering uh, food that they could eat. Uh, around the beginning of the, uh, of, the, of the 6th century, in the 500s AD, we start seeing the first human beings coming in and homes up here. And I don't know if any of you have taken any of the drives around here, but they were called pit houses. And if you take that Mesa Top Loop Drive, uh, you'll see the first pit house you come to is an example of the very first uh, houses that they built in here on the tops of the Mesa. And what had happened is that they were able to uh, to farm. They had brought in uh, seeds with them and they found that they were able to uh, to farm these. And it basically was, it was uh, corn, beans, and, and squash. Now, corn re requires 180 uh, frost-free days from germination to, uh, to uh, a harvest, and, and we had that here. Plus, the soil was really good. And uh, so, um, it's called, the soil is called Los, it's L-O-E-S-S, -S, and it's a windblown soil, blew up from New Mexico and, and Arizona, and, it's, and it landed on the tops of these mesas. It's not real thick, but it was thick enough to grow corn, beans, and squash. Um, corn requires 180 to frost-free days from germination to harvest, and they had that here. So, they make the transition from hunters and gatherers to agriculture on the tops of the mesas. And if you take that mesa top loop drive uh, and you stop at that first that first pull out there where it says uh, pit house, you'll see what they were living in. And so they're living up here um, farming. And then in the in the uh, 16th century, or the uh, the uh, uh, 15th century in the 1400s. Um, the uh, it, it kind of changes, and, and they come off the tops of the mesas and start building in the uh, in the alcoves, like we're seeing right down here with Spruce Tree House. And there was you know a question as to why they did that. Uh, questions of climate change, change in where how they got water, uh, a number of things. Uh, but anyway, they, they they started building in here in the 1200s. And by the 13, beginning of the 1300s, the beginning of the 14th century, they, um, they left. Uh, they didn't leave all at one time, but, but you know, over a period of maybe 50 years, uh, they started leaving and they never came back. And so for roughly 700 years, uh, these places were left untouched. Now there were other native uh, groups that had come into the area. Uh, the Utes and the Navajo, and they knew about these places, but they they felt there was you know there was some some medicine in there, some magic in there that they didn't want to mess around with because that could you know upset could upset the balance, and so they gave these places kind of a wide berth. So we're gonna flash uh, 700 years later. 
Uh, there was a family of ranchers living down in the Mancus Valley called the Witherell family, and they had basically started off. Richard Witherell was was the was the son and uh, the eldest son, and was pretty much responsible for all of the the actions of of, of the cattle ranch that they had they had built uh, over in the Mancus Valley. And he was also kind of really interested in the in the uh, in the architecture of some of these sites because these sites were all over the tops of these mesas, and so he had a um, he had a a, a a Navajo guide, a guy by the name of Akowitz, and uh, Akowitz was telling him that that on 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 this mesa there was this this huge uh, this huge cliff dwelling over on over where he's talking about cliff palace and there was this huge uh, cliff dwelling and, and uh, so Witherell got got excited about that and started looking for it and as the story goes he and his uh, he and his brother-in-law Charlie Mason were out rounding up uh, strays on the tops of the mesas uh, over over by where Cliff Palace was and it was a foggy day and they came to the edge of the of the uh, of the of the mesa and they looked down and the clouds parted and there was Cliff Palace and so he got really interested in that and so they decided that they would they would go down and uh, and they would uh, uh, excavate and look for stuff down there because like there were pots all over the place here, and he had also was, was making a living selling pots uh, to tourists, uh, you know, who would come into the area and, and had heard about these things. But anyway, uh, he got uh, he, he he started excavating, and he and he wrote this down, and and so people were you know this was news. Well, over in Europe at the time, there was a a, a European ex. An explorer, a guy by the name of Gustav Nordenskold, and he was a Swede, and he came from an illustrious family of of excavators. Now, you know, back in the 19th century, uh, a number of European countries, uh, and Britain probably was at the head of it, had gone into colonies or areas that they'd colonized in Africa and just pretty much looted all of the treasures and you think of the British Museum and all of the stuff that's in there from Egypt uh, and, and, and pretty much took that stuff in, and, and the attitude at the time was is that well we were a, you know this was a we were a more advanced race and, and, and we you know we could just do that we could just go in and take everybody's treasures and, and put them in museums and and it was accepted, you know. It was pretty much accepted by by most of the, uh, I guess we would call them the first world countries of that time. And so a lot of this stuff, in especially in Egypt, ends up in the you know in the Royal Museum over in in, in London. Well, um, Nordenskold came from a family of, of explorers. His father was uh, was was responsible for finding one of the passages up in the you know up in the Arctic Ocean up there, and so he did it. And his brother was an ethnographer uh, in South America, so I mean, he came from this family of like let's go out there and see what's what's out there. Anyway. He had come back from an exploration in, uh, Gustav had come back from an exploration where he had found some fossilized plants up in, in, in uh, 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 the Arctic area. And he came back and then he contracted tuberculosis, which back in those days was pretty much a fatal, you know, that was a fatal disease to catch. And so he thought he would, he, he would come to the United States and maybe the, the change of climate would, uh, would, 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 would help his uh, tuberculosis. So he's down, he's, he go, comes to New York and then he goes down into the south and somehow he, he finds out about Witherall's discovery and this is like in 1906. And so he, um, he, he leaves uh, uh, everything in South Carolina and makes a beeline to to Mancus, Colorado, 
and uh, he finds the Witheralls, and and he wants to go on some of these explorations with him, and so uh, he decides to do that. Uh, let me get you, show you guys a picture here of of Gustav. I mean, he's he's quite the robust. Uh, you can go ahead and pass that down. He's quite the robust uh, explorer for the early 20th century. And um, so he, he comes in and, and he basically uh, finances uh, an ex, you know, uh, 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 an excursion into, uh, into uh, uh, Cliff Palace. And so he's like the first, I would say, classically trained archaeologist. I mean, the Witheralls were just kind of, they were looking for pots and stuff that they could sell, but but but, but Norton Skold, like, you know, he actually maps all this stuff out and 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 shows people where, you know, where 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 we're gonna dig and what we're gonna try and find and, and so on and so forth. So anyway he he starts to excavate and he he takes some of the very first pictures of um, he takes some of the very first pictures of the of the sites here. So uh, let me go ahead and give you guys a couple of these. These are pictures of um, spruce tree house that he took, and you guys can just kind of take a look at those. Um, so this is what you would. See. This is what he saw when he got here. Of what you're looking at down here, and um, he took pictures of, of a number of the sites. Um, That's a closer here. look. So this would have been Cliff. Uh, this would have been Cliff Palace that he mm -hmm. saw. And uh, so, yeah, that's what Cliff Palace looked like when he when he first did the excavations there. Is that the one there, right? This um, is Spruce Tree. They were oh, that's they were, they oh, were pretty, This one was uh, Cliff Palace, the biggest. Yeah. So when you guys take that 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 drive and you see Cliff Palace, I mean, a lot of it is the front part has all been rebuilt, you know, by rest you guys that came into the store. But those would have been pictures that uh, that Warden School took, and he was like, we're talking like the early, early, early 20th century, 19 0 1906, 1905, 1904 in that area. And so he's taken pictures. So we have an idea of what it looked like before uh, the subsequent uh, guys came in here, guys like, um, oh, uh, I can't think of his name right now, but he was, he was, he was a superintendent of the park and uh, he was responsible for a lot of the, you know, refurbishing and building up of the park and uh, of the of the sites but uh, Norton school you know true to his Swedish uh, uh, imperial attitude he he not only did he take pictures of all of this but he loaded up six railroad cars uh, full of artifacts including bodies and skulls of, of people who had been buried in the sites and had them shipped back to um, back to Sweden and uh, the Swedish uh, didn't really want them and so he took he was kind of shopping around for somebody to take this collection of stuff and it finally ended up in the uh, Finnish National Museum uh, in Helsinki, uh, and uh, anyway, he um, he was was pretty much of a uh, pretty much of a man of his times, I guess we would say. He, he adopted that attitude that it was okay to take these things. Um, basically, what happened then was uh, he decided. To, to write a book about that, about his findings here. And if you get a copy, you can find these in most public libraries. It's probably not for sale in, in bookstores and stuff because it's so out of print. This is 1906, and he wrote this book, The Cliff Dwellers of Mesa Verde. And in it, he uh, basically drew all of the diagrams and stuff of what he found and has pictures in here of 
all the sites the way they would have looked this would have been Cliff Palace when he, you know, when when he did the excavations, which I mean, this is kind of a priceless idea of, of, of what was going on here. But uh, anyway, he documents everything, where he found it, how he found it, took pictures of it. So really, the first professional, I guess we would say, archaeological. Um, uh, rendering of of, of, of of what was here okay um, later archaeologists came and uh, and uh, and expanded upon that um, but like I said he took he took enough artifacts put them in a train and sent them back to the East Coast where they were shipped over to Europe well, uh, a lot of the people in this area were making a living off of like going into these sites and, and getting pots and 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 and, and pottery and, and, and things and and, and selling them because I mean, you know a lot of people collected it. This is back in the day of the you know the, the ultra rich uh, industrialists uh, in in the East and in so you know the Carnegies and the Mellons and and all of that stuff and so there, there was a ready market for this stuff from among the American elite um, and the people the local people around here you know wasn't so bad so bad that uh, that uh, he was taking stuff but he was cutting into their cutting into their enterprise of it and so they had him arrested for stealing all this stuff and they took him into Durango and put him up in the Strader Hotel, which is still there. You can see it if you go to Durango. Put him up in the Strader Hotel, and then they had this trial, you know. Well, he, he got exonerated because there was no law against doing what he was doing. And so it got so bad that the U.S. government stepped in, and in 1906, they pass what's known as the Antiquities Act, which makes it illegal for uh, people to sell this stuff. Um, you know, it, it's, it's protected. And so also in 1906, the government uh, uh, charters Mesa Verde National Park as the sixth national park specifically to protect these this stuff from 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 being from being looted and and and, and stolen. Uh, like I said, one of the things that Norton School did though it wasn't just artifacts, but he was shipping bodies and uh, skulls back there as well. And so finally, in the early 2000s, uh, the U.S. government passed uh, what was known as the NAGPRA Act. The Native American Graves and Re Repatriation Act, uh, which uh, basically tried to get s this stuff back. So what happened was is that the, the Finnish museum over there shipped back all of the, the bodies and the skulls, and they actually had uh, the Native people come in, uh, and they, they went off to a place in the park that even the rangers don't know about and and they reburied uh, that stuff but we're still waiting on all of the artifacts because even though the uh, the act uh, that uh, that was passed in 1906 the antiquities act only applied to 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 americans it wasn't an international thing so a lot of that stuff is still sitting in museums uh, through in private collections throughout uh, throughout Europe as well. So um, as you guys take your you know your drive through here, uh, just remember uh, this was a place that pretty much for 700 years had been left untouched. And as you go through and, and you look at some of the. There are a couple of areas where we have these big spotting scopes and you can kind of, there are a whole lot of uh, alcoves in, 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 the, in the park here. And uh, most of those have, uh, have not been, you know, rebuilt. I mean, they've been, they've, 
pretty much the way they, they looked after 700 years or 800 years now. Um, they pretty much look the same, but you know, our major ones, uh, uh, Spruce Tree House, Cliff Palace, uh, Balcony House, uh, those have all been uh, pretty much uh, restored to the way the archaeologists think they would have they would have uh, looked. And um, it, it was interesting. We had a, a, a number of uh, people from the from the Navajo or not Navajo, but the uh, Hopi tribe here the other here, and and they do have uh, they can go into the kivas and have you know have have a what religious whatever they do I had several on the, on a tour yesterday but when we ask them about you know what why they left here and they say well it was time to go and they're not really that crazy about having this stuff all rebuilt you know they left it and uh, it wasn't meant to you know it was time to go and it wasn't really meant to be to be uh, restructured and, and rebuilt so as you go through and you guys take your tours today or you do the driving tours and stuff uh remember from the scopes and if you look out and 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 you're not allowed to go into those sites they're probably pretty much what they look like uh you know after without any restoration but the big ones like like this and 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 balcony house and uh and, and cliff palace have all been restored to what the archaeologists think they they would have looked like had they not uh you know, had 700 years of just sitting there and, and you know and being exposed especially what's kind of interesting too is if you look in the backs of the alcoves that is much more likely to be the way it was I and mean, there's not that much restoration because they're not exposed to the water and uh water is the is the big enemy here so um, if you have any questions i'll be happy to try and answer them for you yeah did they do any uh, genetic uh, uh before they they, they buried, buried, buried this, uh, yeah they had a they had a reburial uh, but they don't make a genetic uh, test on them um, no, no, no. I mean, they, 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 they knew where they came from. Yes, but you know. but, yeah, but now nowadays uh, the people from the original people here say that they are, they are the, the ancestors after. Right. If you get make a genetic test, you could be sure. Well, about that. no, they because uh, I mean, they really didn't. I mean that they 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 are living in pueblos and they claim to be descended from these people. So, you know, yeah. enough. their word is good enough. Their word is good enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is good enough. I mean, it's funny because like when they left, um, you know, I think one of the reasons that they left was was you know, the water situation. I mean, because if you go into these into these these uh, alcove sites, there's water in the back of these sites, and so I was thinking, you know, while they're while they were living on the surface, they probably were getting enough rain. Because if you guys look down in these canyons, there's no water in them; they're all dry canyons. So all of that's coming from precipitation. But they obviously had enough precipitation to grow the food and to and to live, and then. Once once that kind of starts changing, they go back down into the alcoves because there are seep springs down in there, and that's where, that's where they got their water. And your ranger on your tour will probably talk to you about seep springs and all that good stuff. So, so where were the crops raised for this? Well, they probably would have been right up so here on top. Yeah. Much. All right. So yeah. they had quite the hike. Uh, well, yeah, they did, but and it wasn't even a hike. They did a lot of this stuff, especially if you guys take some tours, you'll see the hand and toe holds that they use to climb up that those sandstone cliffs. So, I mean, these guys, I mean, some incredible hand and foot strength, you know, and, and not just carrying themselves, but you know, corn and stuff on their back, and then uh, and then the women, uh, you know, they were primarily grinding that corn into cornmeal. And that's what, you know, they would live on, basically, supplement it with protein from, you know, hunting. At the time, there were bighorn sheep in here. Um, don't see too many of those around anymore. But um, deer, for sure, you, the, 
Yeah, and just be careful when you're driving through here too, because they'll they'll run across the road, and you don't want to hit one of those. But they're deer, and then they're rabbits and, and squirrels and stuff would supplement with protein. Um, the thing that the thing that kind of really uh, shortened their lifespan though was that diet of, of corn because that corn they're grinding it uh, on on stone that's sandstone so you're getting you know all that grit in with that and and it's wearing your teeth down and and once that happens you, you get abscesses and you can't eat and you, you know so yeah so um, their lifespan w was you know I'd say women maybe and they also had, you know, the, the childbirth, you know, problems too. So uh, figuring it all together, the women like maybe mid-20s and, and men maybe early 30s. But, uh, you know, that that diet was, especially with that that uh, that ground corn with the, with the gran you know, the granules of, of, of uh, sand in there probably hastened their life their lifespan so they didn't have any teeth on this uh, well they would have uh, they would have ground them down to the point where uh, on this uh, uh scallops you were talking yeah, about yeah these before. these guys here i mean the, the people who lived in in these in these alcoves yeah i mean that was that and you'll see it as you go through and you take the tours you'll see the the grinding stones that they used and just imagine you're grinding that corn with sandstone and and uh you know, I mean, it's you're going to get that sand in your in your cornmeal, and that grit is that 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 uh, that grit is going to wear your enamel down and and uh, shorten your lifespan.